Fighting Blindness Canada's Viewpoint is a virtual education series that brings you the latest in vision research presented by health experts from across Canada. The webinar you're about to watch is a recording. To learn more about the research we fund and upcoming webinars and events, please visit our website at fightingblindness.ca. This Viewpoint webinar is proudly presented by Bayer and supported by AbbVie, Apalis, Beacon Therapeutics, Janssen, Miera GTX, Novartis, and Roche. Thank you for watching. We hope you enjoy this webinar and share your thoughts with us in the comment section below. Our preeminent speaker this morning, Dr. Sada. Dr. Sada joins us from California, so thank you for coming to Toronto to speak with us. Dr. Sada is the Director of Artificial Intelligence and Imaging Research at the Doheny Eye Institute and Professor of Ophthalmology at the University of California, Los Angeles. Uh, sorry, this is where I should put my glasses on. <laughs> Los Angeles Geffen School of Medicine. He completed his medical degree and further training in ophthalmology, neuro-ophthalmology, and medical retina from Johns Hopkins University and the Wilmer Eye Institute. Dr. Sada's major research interests include retinal imaging and clinical trial endpoint design. He has more than 700 peer-reviewed publications and has been named to the Best Doctors of America list for several years in a row. Dr. Satter, we're thrilled to have you. Please welcome to the stage. Well, thanks so much. It's really a pleasure to, to be here uh, in this forum. So, uh, so uh, actually, um, I think these kinds of programs and events are critically important. Uh, you know, uh, blindness, vision loss, obviously a huge problem. Uh, and it does um, take all of us, I, th I think, to try to make real progress. So uh, one of the, the hot topics uh, these days uh, is artificial intelligence, right? It's all the rage and, uh, you know, there's been a lot of hype over it, maybe even some fear about it recently as people are worried about uh, what, what might happen with AI gone bad, people imagining the Terminator and all those kinds of things. Uh, and so, uh, so you know, but, but, but there are real applications of AI, it seems, in, in ophthalmology and how can it help us in preventing blindness. And I want to talk a little bit about that to sort of look ahead to the future of what might be happening. Uh, and in particular, you know, I want to talk about in the context of age-related eye diseases. That's why I have this title, AI for the aging eye. It was supposed to be a clever AI for AI uh, type, of, uh, type of a title. Uh, but yeah, it's bad if you have to point it out, but anyway, uh, yes. So, um, so first I thought, you know, for this kind of a presentation, um, you know, I think most here are pretty familiar with the eye actually, but it's always worth making sure we're kind of all on the same page. And even when I'm, I'm talking to my patients about, um, about um, eye problems and the like, I oftentimes use this analogy of the eye, it's kind of like a camera, right? So it has a front part of the eye with, uh, with a lens system that, that uh, can focus light uh, to the back part of the eye, uh, or the retina. And the retina is kind of like the film of the camera. The retina is actually kind of like an extension of the brain into the eye. So, so that's why you know front part of the eye issues like the, in the affecting the cornea or the lens of the eye, which when it gets cloudy, we call it a cataract. Those are relatively easier for to us to address, but you can imagine why retinal issues, which because the retina being kind of like part of the brain, extending into the eye, it's harder to deal with because uh, you know, we don't have as many good tools for dealing with brain damage, for example. Uh, in any event, uh, you know, uh, I won't, th there are a number of different conditions that can affect our eye uh, and increase in their frequency as we, uh, as we get older. Uh, this is the, the list that I have on this slide. I'll mention, I mentioned dry eye, cataract, glaucoma diabetic retinopathy, uh, and macular degeneration. This is not meant to be an exhaustive list. There are many more. In fact, I don't have time to talk about all of these in detail. I'm gonna talk uh, just about a couple uh, in diabetic retinopathy and macular degeneration because they're very relevant to these applications for artificial intelligence that I wanted to, to highlight. So diabetic retinopathy. Now, you'll often hear people talk about, well, there's an epidemic of diabetes. Um, and actually, you know, while diabetes is certainly more common as we get older, in many ways you could argue the epidemic is being driven by other things. Uh, there's actually a, a, a real rise in diabetes in younger um, um, people with, because of inactivity and, you know, being on your 
phone and, and on the computer all the time, not getting out there and doing being act, having an active lifestyle has contributed to that. But certainly it is something that increases in frequency with age. And one of the real problems with diabetes uh, is it affects blood vessels all over our body. So it can cause damage to your heart, to your kidneys, but also to the blood vessels in your eye. And, and that retina that I mentioned, again, like the film of the camera, back of the eye, the retina is really rich in blood vessels because nerve tissue, brain tissue, really needs a blood supply because it can, we, our brains and our nerve cells consume a lot of oxygen and other nutrients. So, so conditions that affect the blood vessels obviously are going to be really problematic. And diabetic retinopathy can lead to a variety of problems due to injury to the blood vessels, can lead to bleeding in the eye, uh, the leakage of, of fluid and fats and other things from the blood vessels that can uh, uh, bloat the retina. Uh, these kinds of things, I think it's almost kind of like common sense that, boy, that's probably going to be bad if you have bleeding or this kind of leakage in your eye. And indeed, uh, this is a way that we can lose vision from this condition. The really um, sad thing, though, is that diabetic blindness, at least, is largely preventable. Uh, in fact, they say, we say that 90% of it is preventable if uh, people could be, uh, could be detected early and treated uh, early on. And that's where screening for the disease is really vital. I mean, those of you who have diabetes, your internist or your endocrinologist should be making sure that you are seen at least on a yearly basis by the ophthalmologist. The sad reality, though, is that, um, that many patients are not getting screened. Uh, in fact, when they've done surveys in different countries, uh, they find uh, that, uh, that only a small minority of people are actually going for their screening. In fact, I'm actually sad to report in Los Angeles, we've got some districts where 2% of the diabetics are actually getting their annual screening done, which is really pretty awful. And there are a whole host of reasons. People have studied, like, well, why don't people come and get screened? You know, they know that this is something that's preventable and, you know, it's because they're busy with other things. And the biggest thing is that they don't know that there's a problem because you don't notice it until almost it's, uh, it's too late. Uh, and, and, you know, again, uh, getting into see your eye doctor or what have you, I mean, these, these can be, these can be uh, tedious sometimes. And that's where, um, you know, uh, trying to make it easier to get screened has been a point of focus. I mean, one of the ideas or concepts is bringing care to the patient. Um, in many different countries, have implemented different solutions. When I was in India visiting one of the, the retina specialists there, I mean, they have buses, their vans that kind of carry the eye equipment and things around. We actually have one like that in UCLA as well. Uh, we don't use as much for diabetes screening, more for other eye disease screening. But the point is you're bringing the care maybe like to the community, uh, maybe to, you know, to the neighborhood so that uh, people uh, have one less reason why they can't get in to get their eyes checked. Uh, another solution, though, is something we call telescreening. And I talk. I, I gave the analogy of the eye like a camera, uh, but but you can. Act, the interesting thing is because the eye is kind of translucent because light obviously has to get into our eyes, get to the retina, for us to be able to see. We can also take pictures of the eye. So the eye is a camera, but also we can take pictures of the camera, uh, in this case, uh, and that's a huge advantage for us uh, as ophthalmologists because that means we're actually we're the only people who can actually take pictures of the blood vessels and brain tissue. Right? because we can actually do this kind of pictures of the eye. So you can take pictures of those blood vessels that are being damaged by diabetes. Uh, and so then those pictures could be taken, you know, you, maybe, maybe when you go to see your diabetes doctor, your internist, he can get the pictures and he can send the pictures. The problem is still you have to have someone look at the pictures and give you an answer. And that can lead to delays and other problems. And that's where I'll explain in a moment how artificial intelligence has made a big difference. Okay, so, uh, so let me move on from diabetic retinopathy to say a couple of words about macular degeneration. Now, there's another speaker later, I think this afternoon, who's going to go into detail about macular degeneration. So I don't want to steal her thunder uh, and all the information she's going to tell you about. But there's a few things I've got to mention because they're going to be relevant to this 
uh, presentation. So again, you know, what is the mac? I guess if you're going to talk about macular degeneration, you need to explain. Well, what's the macula? So I explained what the retina is. I said that's like the film of the camera. It contains the light-sensitive cells. So light goes into her eye. It hits the cells in the in the retina. We call them photoreceptors. They receive the photons of light, and they convert that light into electrical and chemical signals that go back to our brain. That's how we see, right? So the macula is the very center part of the retina. Okay, so it's the very center part of the retina that we use for a straight ahead vision. Um, and uh, and so, so again, this condition, macular degeneration, again, the, the official term is age-related macular degeneration because, again, it's something that tends to appear as we get older. Uh, but, but uh, you know, some, some basic facts about this age-related macular degeneration. It is the leading cause of blindness in, uh, in, de in developed uh, nations. Uh, and in fact, it's extremely common. So the, the, we, we say that around 30% of individuals over the age of 65 will have some evidence of macular degeneration. So everyone here in this room likely knows someone who has macular degeneration. Uh, it is more common in women, and some of that probably is related to longevity since women tend to live longer than, than men. Uh, because um, it affects the macula most uh, severely, that's why, where, why central vision is what's most significantly impacted. And obviously, for activities like reading, driving, you know, watching TV, uh, we really depend on our central vision. But it can affect other things as well. In fact, some patients, the first thing they notice is that their vision in dim light is what's affected. And so that's where lighting is pretty important to try to maximize your vision potential uh, in the setting of macular degeneration. The kind of symptoms that people might notice is that just their vision is getting more blur blurry centrally. That's kind of like non-specific. It could be many different things, but that could be one, one thing. You might notice distortion. That straight lines start to seem uh, wavy, and I'll explain why that is in, in a moment. Um, uh, one of the things that you might hear if you go to see your eye doctor, um, they might say, well, I, you know, how did I diagnose macular degeneration? Well, I saw a drusen in your eye. So what's a drusen? Drusen is kind of like, you can almost imagine it as if it's like trash building up in your eye of sorts. It's kind of like the, the proteins and the fats and other things that are constantly being turned over and broken down in our eyes. Our eye is no longer as efficient at clearing it out. So there's kind of a delay of that, and so that builds up as this material. Uh, and so that's what they call as drusen. You'll hear that term a lot if you go um, see your um, eye doctor about macular degeneration. Uh, and eventually these deposits and things building up there can start to weaken the tissues in the back of the eye. And then uh, blood vessels from deeper parts of the eye can grow in and they can start to bleed and, uh, and leak fluid. And then we call that so-called wet macular degeneration. It's not actually a separate disease. It's all part of macular degeneration. It's just, it's one of the complications that can arise. And you can imagine, uh, I don't think it takes, um, you know, it's, it's, as I said, it's kind of like common sense to think that if, if you're getting bleeding back there, much like with diabetic retinopathy, that's not gonna be good for your vision. And so that can damage those, sense, those, those uh, special light sensitive cells. Now, the good news with wet macular degeneration is that we have ways of trying to treat those blood vessels that are bleeding and causing harm. We have, uh, uh, we, we, over the, again, I have to confess, when I first trained in ophthalmology, we didn't have these treatments. So my conversation with patients with macular degeneration was, I'm really sorry this happened. Uh, I wish there was something more we could do. It was really pretty awful not to be able to do something to be able to help. Uh, but we do have these uh, injections that, that can certainly make the bleeding, um, you know, at least stop further bleeding, uh, shrink those uh, blood vessels. The downside is that these injections don't last very long. They have to be injected into the eye, into the middle cavity of the eye. Um, and, uh, and they have to be repeated pretty often, right? So every couple of months you're having to repeat these uh, injections. Uh, and unfortunately, they don't stop the progressive loss of light-sensitive cells. Sometimes we call that atrophy or dry AMD uh, that continues to progress. So, so you can still, you know, these deposits aren't going away from those injections. So the deposits can slowly wear out the cells, light-sensitive cells disappear, and you develop the so-called atrophy. So you'll hear a, a lot more about atrophy these days. There's, there's a lot of television ads about atrophy these days because, uh, because you know, obviously atrophy is the ultimate end stage 
of macular degeneration, atrophy meaning loss of the light sensitive cells. Uh, and, uh, and so, uh, you know, one of the reasons you'll hear a lot about it these days is because that we finally have some uh, treatments um, for uh, trying to slow down this progression of atrophy, okay? So, so they recently, uh, or at least uh, the FDA cleared two different drugs now uh, that again have to be injected inside the eye, but can slow things down. Now, unfortunately, they only slow things down a little bit. So uh, that, you know, it does help you keep reading and driving longer. So I think these are important, uh, but, uh, but we still have a ways to go uh, because again, these things have to be repeated every month, these injections, you know, forever, basically at this stage until we get something better. Um, and, uh, and so, and as I said, still, it's not completely stopping the atrophy from progressing. So we still have a ways to go, uh, but at least there's been progress made. So that's kind of like just, you know, again, as I said, I wish I could have talked in detail about all these conditions. I talked about diabetic retinopathy and AMD or macular degeneration detail, because I'm going to want to explain a bit about how artificial intelligence fits in. And you can kind of guess where I'm going with this, because I kind of hinted at this, right? I said that uh, some of these conditions um, you know, can progress pretty silently, especially diabetic retinopathy, glaucoma I didn't talk about uh, in detail, but also something where it can progress silently. You don't know you're losing vision from it until you've lost a lot of vision. Even can happen with macular degeneration. You can have a lot of atrophy, and just because it's not in the very center, you may not have noticed it. Uh, and so these are all conditions where it would be great if we could screen for the disease efficiently and so we can get patients into treatment earlier. And this is where I think is one of the big applications of artificial intelligence. And so just like I started when I talked about the eye and uh, I said, like, let's start with an introduction. What is, you know, what is the eye? How does it work? Uh, we need to have some definitions. We need to talk about what is artificial intelligence. And I hope you'll indulge me a little bit uh, as I get into, uh, into this. I'll try not to wander off into the weeds too far, but I want to explain uh, some of the concepts. So what is uh, artificial intelligence? Uh, basically, again, there's this kind of a Venn diagram. Oh, actually, you know, the color is not projecting very well. There's supposed to be a circle, uh, but it's not, I'm going to explain it anyway, because I know not, not everyone can see the, the, the slides. But artificial intelligence, basically the concept is that you're enabling machines to think like humans. Machine learning is another term you'll hear. Machine learning is sort of a subset of artificial intelligence, but it's the concept of training a machine to get better at doing some job without specifically programming it. So the machine kind of figures it out. Uh, and then deep learning is a special type of machine learning that's based on how the algorithm or the software is constructed. And I'll explain that in a second. So, so these are some of the common terms you'll hear, uh, but, uh, but, I'll, but I'll, I'll, get, I'll dive into each of these in a bit more uh, detail. So artificial intelligence actually has a bit of a history. Uh, it, I know it seems like all the rage now, and it's true, and I'll explain why that is as well. But it dates back several decades, probably to at least the, the 1950s. And, and most of you, I think, know um, about um, Alan Turing. You've probably seen the imitation game. Uh, but he was a mathematician, um, uh, and in 1950, he wrote a landmark paper about, about computing, um, and, uh, uh, computing machinery intelligence. And he actually posed this question, can machines think? And he said, well, probably not yet. But he thought that eventually machines would be able to think. And he said, well, how, do we, how can we tell? How can we tell that a machine can think? or is intelligent. Uh, and so he came up with something called the Turing test, which has sort of been out there in this space for a long time. And he said that the way you'd be able to tell whether a machine was intelligent is if the machine could carry on a conversation with you and you didn't know it was a machine. So, so it'd be on the other line, let's say on the phone, and you're talking to it, um, and you couldn't tell it was a machine, then that would be the test. 
that, that you actually had true intelligence. And actually, I have to say that we're actually kind of there now. There are actually machines can, that can do that. So Alan Turing would have been probably, and not surprised because he said he thought it would eventually be possible, uh, but perhaps we're, we're, we're just about at that point. The term artificial intelligence itself, though, uh, was uh, dates back to uh, to the 1950s as well. So John McCarthy is another name you might hear. Many people consider him to be the father of artificial intelligence or AI. He'd organized. He was a professor at Dartmouth. He organized a a meeting there uh, where he brought all these different experts in this field, and that's when this sort of term artificial intelligence actually first arose. And, and there have been some, there was some incremental progress over the next several decades on trying to make machines smarter and smarter to the point that uh, perhaps they could think. Uh, but really, um, you know, it's not your imagination that AI has become a hot topic in the last few years because it's really this past decade where things have really taken off. Uh, and so why is that? What was the breakthrough that suddenly made AI all of the rage? And really it comes down to two things. There's two things that you need to achieve artificial intelligence. One is that you need to have really fast computers. Okay, so computing power has obviously continued to increase steadily, uh, and it's really taken some huge leaps in the last several years. And the other piece, because that alone wouldn't do it, the other thing that you need to have is you need to have lots of data. So you need to be able to train these things. So everyone here, I think, is now familiar with ChatGPT. And ChatGPT is basically based on, it's trained with kind of all of the knowledge that's out there on the internet type of thing. Sometimes it's bad knowledge. That's why it can give you wrong answers. Uh, but it's got all this information, right? And so, and, and now, you have, now you have to go along with lots of information, the computing power, to be able to learn all of it. So that combination is what's made things possible. And now people have started to do these com comparisons of comparing the human brain versus a computer. And you can compare it based on speed. And actually, because our brain relies on chemicals that have to go between the connections between the neurons, it actually is slower than the electrons moving inside a computer. From a speed perspective, a computer is already faster. Um, now computers have memory capacity that sort of starts to uh, equal our brain. The only thing that maybe computers are not quite there, but that's probably also disappearing fast, is running parallel processes, right? By that I mean that our brain has to, like if our brain could only do one thing at a time, that'd be a serious problem because it would have to, like, you know, you'd have to use one second to do your heart and then one second to do your liver. No, it runs all these things at the same time. Uh, and so um, now computers can, can run a lot of parallel processes as well. So that's where, you know, it's not shocking that we're at this point where you can have artificial intelligence. Okay, so I, I promised I'd explain what deep learning is because you'll hear that term a lot. So um, uh, it was, uh, you know, as, as was mentioned, I, um, you know, spend a large part of my career involved in image analysis. As I said, we're fortunate in ophthalmology. We can take pictures of the eye, of the inside of the eye. But then we have to analyze those pictures. Uh, and so uh, we've wanted to always try to take advantage of a machine helping us do this analysis. And so we spend a lot of time trying to develop computer programs to do that. Uh, and so traditional computer science, let's say I wanted to design a system that can identify pandas. Well, in the past, I'd tell it, well, you know, look for a white circle about yay big, and inside that white circle or attached to that white circle, look for some black circles that could be its ears or these, the black circle around its eyes. And I have to tell it all these things. Look for this, 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 and this, and then, aha, it's a panda. The problem with those systems is that the moment, like for example, maybe the panda was upside down or like it was only half of the panda was showing, the system would get confused because you couldn't tell it all these different possibilities, right? So it would be too difficult to program that. And so we were kind of spinning our wheels, not really making any real progress because you'd spend like years designing the system only to find that when you showed it some different variation it couldn't manage it, okay? So that's where 
de um, uh, you know, deep learning, as I'll explain, has made a huge difference. So with deep learning approaches, and this is sort of more generally machine learning approaches, you don't tell it, look for this, this, and this. You say, here's a panda. I'm going to show you another picture of a panda. Here's another picture of a panda. It learns what it thinks is important for making that distinction. So I never told it, look for this, this, or this. I just told it, this is what this is. Uh, and so, so if I want to design a system that can distinguish cats, dogs, raccoons, honey badgers, whatever, I just need to show it a thousand pictures of a cat, a thousand pictures of a dog. And then the next time I showed a picture of a cat, it says, ah, that's a cat, not a dog. So that's basically the concept. And how does it do that? Well, it does that through having multiple layers. And when we talk about deep learning, we're talking about the depth is really how many layers of processing that you have. So it means that you, know, you have one layer of processing that connects to another, that connects to another. And that's kind of how, it kind of makes sense that this should work because it's kind of our brains are kind of organized. You have one layer of nerve cells that feeds its information to the next layer of nerve cells, that feeds its information to the next layer of nerve cells, and so on and so forth. That's really how many parts of our brain are organized like that. Uh, and that's where we're able to take complex tasks and break them down. So I'll just give an example of just even your smartphone. Many of them have facial identification, right? So it sees your face, knows it's you, and can unlock it. Actually, if you put a pair of sunglasses on and, and look at it, it's able to unlock it. It's able to deal with, or I put a hat on my head and then still look at it, it's still able to figure it out. It's able to deal with these different variations. And that's because the fact that it's organized in layers means it breaks down the task. At the first layer, it may just wanna know, is there anything in the frame that I'm looking at? The next layer might say, oh, is there some kind of vague outline of a face there? And the next layer it might say, oh, is there an ear there or a nose or, or what have you? It, so my point is it breaks down the task into these different layers. And that allows it to be more flexible to accommodate variations. And so that's the concept of deep learning, having that layered system. Okay, so, so again, um, you know, I, I wanted to say that, that you know, it's, it's pretty exciting stuff. But I just wanted to highlight, without getting too far into the weeds of this, that it's far from perfect, okay? So, um, so there are many pitfalls to keep in mind. One, as I said, is that you need a lot of data, right? So if you don't show the system enough variations, it's not gonna be able to necessarily figure it out. I mean, these systems do pretty well, but, uh, but they need a lot of information in order to get the job done. Also, sometimes you can, um, you can, you, can, you can make the system uh, sort of overperform, meaning that you show it the data set that it trains on, it learns from, but if you, turn, if you change, adjust the parameters too tightly, it may perfectly work for that data set, but then it might lose its ability to adapt to something that's slightly different. We call that overfitting. That's another problem. Another problem that I want to highlight is something that I think is very important, which is limitations of frame. The, the, these, these systems only know what they know. They only know what they've seen. So for example, if I design a system that I want it to be able to tell me whether there is diabetic retinopathy or damage from diabetes present in the image, but I show it a patient with macular generation, and I've never shown it a picture with macular generation before, I've never told what macular generation looks like, it may not know what to do with it. And it may make some kind of bizarre choices. Like for example, if I train a system to identify dogs, uh, like uh, the face of a dog, and then I have a muffin that happens to have like, you know, like blueberries positioned in the right location, looks like the eyes or the nose of the dog, it's gonna say, oh, that's a dog because it didn't even know that a muffin exists, right? So, um, so it's, it's a matter of like, you know, it, it only is as good as the training it gets. Okay, so that's an important thing to keep in mind. The other thing that, pe that I think really gets people nervous about artificial intelligence, just gonna see how I'm on time. Artificial intelligence is, is something we call explainability. And by that, what do I mean by that? I mean that, you know, we don't know, because as I said, we don't tell it, look for this, look for that to figure it out. We don't know why it got the answer. So there's this classic example of a system that was designed to distinguish a husky 
from a wolf. Obviously, they have some facial resemblance, so you might think that's got to be a pretty sophisticated system to be able to distinguish a husky from a wolf, and it seemed to perform really well. But sometimes they saw that it wasn't working very well. And there was this example uh, that, uh, that just, to, just for those who can't see the screen, just to show, I'm showing a picture of a, of a husky that's got some snow in the background, and it was misidentified um, as, a, as, a, um, as a wolf in this case. And it turned out the way the system was working was that it was not actually detecting a husky or wolf. It was just detecting snow. So anytime it saw snow in the background, it said, aha, that's a wolf. Anytime there wasn't snow in the background, it said, that's a husky. So, um, so again, you know, it got it right, but for the wrong reasons. And so that's another challenge with AI. Okay. All right. So in any event, despite all that, and despite some of the recent, like, oh my goodness, AI is going to take over and kill us like the Terminator, generally, um, there's been a lot of positive hype around AI. So like people sometimes show these hype curves where they say like, you know, there's a lot of excitement in the field and then people start to realize, oh, there's a lot of problems and they start to get, um, maybe we're almost getting into that, like we're seeing all the problems phase and then eventually you, you settle into, okay, this is what it, what the reality is really like. So, so again, just to give an example, I mean, Jeffrey Hinton, that's a name you'll hear a lot. He's many times people call him the modern father of AI. Uh, but he said a few years ago, well, it's pretty obvious we should stop for training radiologists. And my brother's a radiologist, so he's kind of nervous. But, but they said, like, you know, um, let, we need to stop training him. Now, over the years, it's evolved to like, well, okay, radiologists who at least know how to use AI will probably survive, but people who don't won't. So it's kind of like, you know, I guess it, it sort of shows you how this sort of hype curve uh, kind of evolves. But as I said, ophthalmology really is at the tip of the spear when it comes to AI and medicine large part because again, we have images, but other, other fields like, you know, radiology obviously also use images. Um, uh, you know, dermatology does as well. A few other fields uh, also um, are, are certainly looking at AI deployments. So uh, in the last uh, few minutes, I'm going to just um, talk about some of the areas where you can expect to see AI and ophthalmology. I put right at the top uh, of that list, disease screening. And, uh, and this is where um, it's, al it's, already, oops, it's already out there, uh, this kind of disease uh, screening. And in fact, uh, there's a number of different diseases I highlighted earlier, like glaucoma or macular degeneration, uh, in addition to diabetes, where screening would be very important. Uh, but as I said, um, you know, in that telescreening model where you take the images, maybe when you go to your internist or maybe when you go to the drugstore and you get the images taken, they could be sent. Um, right now, they'd have to be sent to somebody to look at them. But imagine you could just upload them to the cloud. And in the cloud, the AI machine spins and spits out the answer. Uh, and that already exists. As I said, uh, there are systems. We've published many papers from our group on this concept of systems that can do a very good job of this. There are actually three systems that are, that are in, uh, on the slide. I'm showing an asterisk, not so important. Uh, I just would mention that there are three systems that are already FDA cleared to do this. So they're already being deployed. So this is not like, well, some science fiction or something for the future. It's happening now where they're using these kinds of systems to automatically make this kind of determination. Uh, but you can imagine moving beyond just screening. Screening means, do you have the condition or not? That's screening. It's a yes, no, binary decision. But you can imagine, you could take it one step further. You might say, I only, not only do I want to know if I have macular degeneration, I want to know how bad is my macular degeneration? So that's called staging, okay? What stage I'm at. So that's one level more than just a yes, no. You have to say, is it one, two, three, four, or five? Uh, and so that's happening as well. You can have, uh, again, this is, not, this is not something that is uh, available in by, or approved by the FDA or something like that. This is, this is uh, something that's in, in more of a research phase, uh, but certainly they seem to be systems that can do that. Or for example, Let's say that I have macular degeneration, I have wet macular degeneration, I have the bleeding vessels that I mentioned earlier, and I need to get eye injections. Well, you can detect the bleeding, you can detect the fluid in the eye um, using AI um, algorithms. And in fact, you know, um, one of the exciting developments, and we expect this to be FDA approved, for example, 
uh, later this year, uh, is the, con uh, the concept that you might be able to take your own pictures at home. So normally you go to your eye doctor, those of you who have macular degeneration or have loved ones with macular degeneration, they go in every month, um, get their eye injections, you know, the hour they go in, the eye doctor looks, says, okay, you know, they get the pictures, they say, okay, you've got fluid, you need to have a shot. Um, and uh, imagine you're at home every day, you're just taking your own pictures. It tells you, bing, 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 you've got fluid, you need to go in and get your shot, right? So that's what we're looking for, that we're expecting next year. That's one of the systems we're gonna be starting to use and um, uh, use is, is, is this, kind of, this kind of a scheme. Uh, and I think it's just a start. I think that you're gonna see many more home-based diagnostics, okay? Uh, that you will uh, then be able to use powered by AI. In fact, you actually can, I didn't, I didn't include this in my presentation, but I'll just mention as an aside that you can have, um, you know, there, you can use groups, you can use your phone, uh, actually, as it turns out, to take pictures of your retina, a little adapter, and then that can be, have the picture sent to the cloud and analyzed and tell you whether you've got diabetic retinopathy. So that also is a application that's out there to be aware of. But where we can go with this, though, sort of the next step would be, you know, many here, I think most of you are familiar with the concept of insulin pump, right? An insulin pump for diabetes, like it's kind of continuous, it's, it's something you wear, it's measuring <clears throat> the blood sugars in your bloodstream, and then it's sort of pumping in insulin kind of on an as-needed basis based on your sugars. Well, you can imagine if you have a, um, if you have a home um, um, diagnostic device, that then you know, gets the images, okay, and then connects those images to AI to tell you do you have like, fluid or not, that if you have a pump that's installed on your eye, it can just, you don't have to keep going into the ophthalmologist, you can just have it pump in the medication on demand, right? So that's kind of what we're um, evolving to. Uh, and so uh, similarly, you know, again, um, there have been machines that can kind of just take a picture of your eye and then, then uh, make the diagnosis. And people have done studies, very important study, this is um, where they showed that the system could do about as well as a retina doctor in making the diagnosis. That was kind of scary um, at, uh, at, uh, uh, at, at Moorfield. In fact, there's even uh, more interesting stuff, like you can take a picture of your eye, as it turns out, in, within the picture of your eye, you can tell uh, with a high degree of accuracy whether you're a man or a woman based on, based on um, uh, taking a picture like this, or your, it can guess your age. Even better than remember, like you used to go to these fairs and it guess like, you know, this is, you know, I think this is your way or it's your age. You actually can do a lot of that, it turns out, just by taking a picture of your eye, which is kind of astonishing. Uh, but that's again, this is all a matter of training. You imagine how that was done, right? They just showed it, the, showed the system, a thousand pictures of somebody who's 50 and a thousand pictures of somebody who's 55, and it started to figure out what are those differences. Um, the really exciting thing for the future, though, is something we call, you'll hear more of this term used, thrown around a lot, the era of personalized medicine. Personalized medicine means the right treatment for the right patient at the right time. And that's something that could be dictated by AI as well. So, for example, wouldn't it be great if, you know, let's say you, it wouldn't be great to have wet macular generation, but let's say you had wet macular generation, wouldn't it be great if it could just tell you, well, this is how many injections you're going to get. This is what your vision is going to be like two years from now, right? So predicting outcomes. Or, or let's say you have atrophy and you're thinking about taking one of the new atrophy medications. If you can predict, well, if you didn't take it, this is how bad it's going to get, right? So a very personalized prediction for you. Uh, that's, that's, that's something to look forward to. Or just simply say, let's say that you have a, a disease for which there's treatment A, B, C, or D. And you're wondering, well, what's the best one for me? Well, the software might be able to tell you that. That's what we mean by personalized medicine. Also, you know, there are maybe opportunities in, in, in surgery. I mean, we have, um, uh, there's a lot of uh, ro robots now that can help with surgical procedures. Uh, and because of, uh, of increased speed, uh, like, uh, like 5G uh, and the like, where you don't have as much latency, because it'd be kind of bad, right? If like, you know, you had a robot, but it took like five seconds for you to send it a command to say, okay, now, you know, put the scalpel there. That would, could lead to problems, but if you can do that really fast, then there's an opportunity to potentially have robotic surgery. In fact, one of my colleagues at UCLA, he's developing instrumentation connected to a robot to do the surgery kind of automatically. Now, whether or not 
people are going to feel comfortable with that. It's a different story. Uh, but uh, but uh, yeah, but people have asked uh, you know, many times, like, well, with all this technologies, well, what does it mean for doctors? Is this the end of the road uh, for physicians? Um, of course, I'm just a little self-serving, but I'm going to argue that it's not, uh, that we'll, um, we'll have um, some role um, going forward. I think it's going to change. I think we're going to use more AI tools as physicians, but um, I think most of the time, you know, uh, I think most people will probably want to have somebody, even though the systems, as I said, can already probably outperform doctors for certain things, I think people will still want to have a doctor make the confirmation. Also, I'm not sure how good a robot Robot's bedside manner is going to be. So I mean, so uh, probably like you know you'll probably, maybe there's some doctors who probably could get, have a better bedside manner. Maybe that robots can't perform some of them. But anyway, you'd like to think that that um, that uh, you know people might want to hear difficult diagnoses and things. Better to have it from a human being uh, than from a robot. So anyways, um, I think I'm my, I, I think uh, I think Morgan was indicating my time is about up, uh, but I'll just summarize um, that uh, you know I think AI um, certainly has come a long ways as I've tried to il illustrate, and I think it really is on the precipice of really seeing. And I think it's already past the precipice because we have it for diabetic neuropathy screening right now. But to really impact patients, I think it's going to have a huge impact on on, on blindness. Uh, going forward, so it's really relevant to talk about here. Um, as I said, um, you know these big uh, big data sets. That's where uh, you know all the data and the computing power those together are really what's powered this uh, revolution. Um, and I've, I've given you a highlight of some of the potential areas where I think AI is going to actually start to make a difference, um, and expect that this is going to continue over the next several years. So thanks very much, uh, and for allowing me to be here and. Glad to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Sandler. So we will take the questions now. Melissa will bring the mic around. So just wave your hand in the air if you have a question. Is AI going to be able to diagnose before you become totally blind or partially blind with macular? Yeah, I, I, that, that's exactly the concept. Yeah, great question. Um, uh, the concept is that it would predict, uh, hopefully be able to predict for an individual person what your expectation could be. And the way it would do that is you'd feed it information for thousands and thousands of patients uh, at, d at different stages uh, and with, with data over time. And so it would say, well, it would compare you against that big database and say, yep, based on that, this is likely going to be your course. So yeah, that, that is one of the ex expectations we have. We're not quite there with that one yet, but that is what we're expecting. Uh, could you clarify for me the three systems? The three systems um, for? You mentioned that there were three systems. Oh, I, well, I mentioned that there were three um, systems that are F, the F, already FDA cleared for diabetic retinopathy screening. So if you're interested in the names, one of them is from a company called IDX. Uh, another is from a company called INUK, E-Y-E-N-U-K. And the most recent one was from a company called AI, but it's A-E-Y-E. Okay, thank you. Yeah. mentioned about age-related macular degeneration. I had uh, myopic degeneration, and my doctor said, forget it, we're not going to do anything for you because there's too, not enough people, and we're going to make uh, a lot of money with age-related, but not for you guys. I just want to yeah, no. The, the, uh, well, I, I don't agree with that state. Uh, the statement about the about the about uh, the not very many people. Um, it's um, I, I will agree. I would definitely say that there's not been as much research into myopia, but that's changing. Um, you know, I didn't mention it in my talk because it's not necessarily age related, and I kind of said AI for the aging eye. Uh, but um, but uh, myopic degeneration is is quite common as an increase in frequency. Some people have called, also called it an epidemic. Now it's more common in Asia than it is in um, is in, than in North America. But it's not that we don't have it with some frequency here. And I'm sorry that you had that problem. Uh, but uh, but because of the right, and it, it is true that there is something that, that is it's just the reality of the world we live in is that for diseases that are not very common, there tends to be not as much investment because 
you know, there are limited resources and people are investing in, um, in and where, they're, where they perceive there could be the biggest um, impact in terms of number of patients. Uh, but I don't think that's the case for me. I think myopia is uh, it's, it's increasing frequency is actually uh, spurred a lot of interest. So I think you'll actually see more development um, in myopia going forward. Yes. In future, can AI replace guide dogs? Do we replace gu guide dogs? Um, you know, that's a great question. Um, I would, um, I mean, there, there are obviously robots, uh, and you can imagine that, you know, people are, I, 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 you know, we have self-driving cars now, not perfect by any means, but they're improving. So I guess... You know, I'm trying to think, you know, there's sort of an analogy, I guess, between a self-driving car and a self-driving, you know, guide dog kind of thing. So, so possibly, I mean, I, but yeah, I, I haven't thought of, it's a great question. I haven't really thought about that. Hi. Um, or I'm not sure where, where. Hi. Ah, okay, hi there. Um, so you listed the uh, conditions that might affect Yes. So um, I didn't. Uh, I, I only didn't talk about IRDs again. As I said, I had limited time and focused it more on a sp few specific aging-related diseases. Um, but uh, yes. So um, uh, so one of the things with uh, that we're using AI for right now, even in, um, just as more research phase, is trying to see if by taking the images we can sort of guess the genetic mutation for example, uh, based on that. And that requires a lot of training, but uh, that's something that potentially is, is, uh, is feasible. But ultimately, maybe, you know, we might use it for patient, for treatment selection as well. I mean, there's a lot of excitement in, in the IRD space because there's obviously some approved gene therapies, but now there's the concept of using gene therapies. Like, so there's a, there's a new technology called optogenetics where you can potentially make the non-light sensitive cells that are remaining in the eye become light sensitive. Um, and so, so is that the right treatment or should you pick a cell-based treatment or something of that sort? We might imagine how AI could help us in choosing the right treatment option for someone. So, um, so obviously the diabetic retinopathy screening applications are already there. The next thing is going to be in diagnosing, that's going to be approved, is going to be in diagnosing fluid that'll help um, you, you know when to go back, go in to see the doctor. I think the issue of trust, I think it's not just, it's, it's both for patients and also for physicians to trust it, is, is just going to take time and experience. So you can imagine that this next phase when we have these fluid detectors and the like is, that you're going to see, you're going to, you know, it's gonna, the system is going to set off a warning, say, bing, 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 there is fluid. You need to get in to see your doctor right away. Uh, and that's then the proof is going to be in doctors and the patients seeing that, yep, that worked. Uh, and I think that's what's going to lead to acceptance over time is, is seeing that. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it is kind of a brave new world. It's, it's unclear to many, even, to many of us even working in the field exactly how it's all going to shake out because our systems, our healthcare systems, we haven't really built them thinking about this in this way. So, so you can imagine that my own personal belief is in the future, more and more of us are going to make, be making a more home diagnoses. We're going to, it's not going to be like Star Trek completely where, you know, you just scan yourself and it'll just tell you something, uh, but maybe getting closer to that, um, closer to that kind of reality where, where, you know, and that's maybe how you organize your healthcare system, where you have a certain level where, you know, you have to do it yourself and then you escalate it up based on that. So I, I do think also the other thing is that you might have it extend, uh, you know, like you don't necessarily need to have a doctor at every clinic. You could have your AI doctor and then you only get the other doctor when, you know, there's some uncertainty. So I think that's where how things are going to shake out over time. But that's just my guess. Yeah. You know. Injections 
for over 12 years. And one of my eyes, so right next to it, and one of my eyes has atrophied. And you're telling me that there's a, a new medication that, for this condition? Yeah, so, so there, there's actually two medications um, that are FDA cleared. I actually saw somebody um, earlier from one of the companies that makes one of the medications, Apellis. Um, and so, yeah, there, there are two medications. Now, they're, they're evaluated in patients who had they never developed wet macular degeneration. They just went straight to atrophy. So to be clear, we don't know for sure what the best use is when you've had wet macular degeneration, you developed atrophy. I think it's still applicable, but I'm saying that that wasn't evaluated in the studies. Uh, but but uh, but yeah. So so the, the so the answer to your question, yes, there are two um, tre treatments that are FDA cleared now, uh, and uh, and uh, you know they're, they're, I don't mean to pretend that they're perfect because they don't stop the atrophy; they slow it down by about twenty percent or so a year. Uh, and so, but it's something, um, and, uh, and if, and it, sometimes it could be the difference between being able to drive or not, or extending that time. And so we think it's, we think it's an important step forward, but still a ways to go in terms of what we'd like to achieve. There's just one, one other thing I'd like to say. Um, I'm now getting injections in my second eye, which is also the wet macula, but the first eye that was atrophied why would that be? So sometimes, you know, it's inter it's interesting that um, that uh, when when you have it when you have a, a condition or retinal condition that damages part of the retina, uh, you know, your brain has an ability to try to find the next best spot of the retina to use, right? So it, there's still other areas that aren't involved, um, and when your other eye, the vision is good, you can look at it as it's not quite as motivated to find that best spot. And sometimes when your second eye gets affected, your first eye improves in part because now your brain is motivated to try to utilize more information. And I'm not saying you're doing it consciously, I'm just saying that's just how kind of things work. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to um, mention the, the drugs for geographic atrophy. There's nothing approved in Canada yet. We're hoping that they will come to Canada um, in 2024, but currently there's no yeah, thank you, because I, I don't know the approval status in Canada so yet, yet. So, yeah, thank you. All right, well, thank you for your practice battle. Thank you.